Okay, so everyone can hear me? Good. So, um, hi and welcome. My name is Ines Juvan and I'm a PhD student from the Space Research Institute in Graz, Austria. And today I would like to present to you my code Python spot. Uh, so the idea was to have a Python routine which is fast, flexible, and easy to use. And it should be capable of performing a um, transit light curve analysis um, for stars with and without spots. And then it also takes into account stellar limb darkening. Um, it is capable of modeling or fitting for a time polynome or also to include external parameters which affected, um, or which affected the observation. And so the code is based on an approach uh, used by Jeremy Treglow and Reed. And it's a pixelation approach which uh, projects the star, the spot and the transit cord or transit um, path on a two-dimensional grid. And uh, yeah, so on the next slide, you can show that I tested it or tried to validate the, or validated the code um, for a WASP-53 uh, light curve data set. Those are only two light curves. Um, if you're more interested in the code and the first results, then please meet me at my poster at number 22. And here you can see basically on the left side that it could um, model my spot and also take into account external parameters. And on the right hand side, you see that it works without spots as well. And of course, also there was an XY shift at the beginning of the observation from the telescope, which could also be uh, taken into account. So yeah, if you have any more questions, please just meet me at my poster. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Anthony Guy, and I'm from the University of Albany, and I'm here to talk about ellipsoidal variations. So ellipsoidal variations uh, are caused by a star deviating from a spherical shape due to a companion planet. Uh, they appear with two maxima per orbit, each located when the greatest stellar area is being observed. Uh, in my examination, I've compared three different trigonometric models, Beer, shown here in blue, Canon Gelino 2012 in green, and a modified version of Canon Gelino in red. Interestingly, this modified version seems to uh, well approximate the more computationally intensive EVIL MC, which you can see here in cyan. Uh, could I go to the next slide, please? Yep. So, uh, in the Bayesian framework, uh, we use, uh, or we can do model testing by comparing the evidences, which essentially acts as a prior weighted average for the likelihood. Um, the uh, algorithm ExoNest uses such a framework. Uh, I used ExoNest, ran it five times for each of the models in both circular in and eccentric orbits for the Kepler-13 system. Uh, for the Kepler-13 system in circular orbits, the Beer and Canon Gelino modified models were nearly indistinguishable uh, and slightly more preferred over the regular Canon Gelino model. All three of these trigonometric models were significantly preferred over no variation at all. So that sh uh, shows that uh, in the Kepler-13 light curve, ellipsoidal variations are a very significant effect. And so down here in the bottom, we see uh, EVIL MC, uh, an exaggerated version of a star. This is EVIL MC showing the Kepler-13 system. So even though the ellipsoidal variations are such a significant effect, uh, there's the, it's a very, very slight uh, change to the stellar shape. So we don't see these giant eggs out there. So I'll, I have a poster out there too, so you can come see me there as well. Hello, my name is Emiliano Jofre. I'm a postdoc at the Astronomical Observatory of Cordoba in Argentina. And together with Romina Petrucci and Mercedes Gomez are carrying out a photometric follow-up of southern stars with transiting planets. I mean to search for additional planets in this system via the transit timing variation technique or TTB. Very briefly, if only the detected transiting planet is orbiting the, the star, then the time interval between successive transits should be constant. However, uh, gravitational interaction with additional planets uh, present in the system might produce periodic variation in the mid-transit time, such as this already detected from Kepler data. And this is the kind of signals that we are looking for in our ground-based project. Uh, next slide, please. For this project, we are monitoring a sample of uh, southern stars uh, with B magnitude brighter than 14 uh, since uh, 2011. And we are employing three telescopes located in Argentina. And so far, we have observed uh, over 50 transits for more than 10 exoplanets. 
and have presented results for three systems, was 4 was 28 and recently was 46 although we haven't found any signs of uh, additional planets in these systems. Uh, well, if you are interested in this project or want to know more detail, please uh, check out our poster, poster uh, 31 and 21, uh, or contact me or Romina. Thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean. I am a master's student at the University of North Dakota Space Studies Department, which does a lot of a lot of everything. We did space history, human space flight, and also planetary science and, and that kind of stuff. So I'm doing uh, exoplanet observations here. Uh, we're using the 16-inch or 40-centimeter telescope that we have at UND uh, to observe recently discovered hot Jupiter planets. Uh, the targets that I'm going to be observing, I narrowed it down from the list on exoplanets.eu from all 3,000 planets that are there now. Basically just to see, based on how observable it would be for the telescope that I have access to. So big planets, uh, bigger than radius, half Jupiter, brighter than the 13th magnitude, discovered since 2011. That's where there's something I can actually contribute to uh, the data sets, or these are data sets that most need improvement. Uh, and I looked at the list of 300 planets uh, that fit those criteria, looked at every transit for those planets between May and November 2016, to, s to see if they would be observable from my site in uh, North Dakota. And what shook out are 73 different transit events across 18 unique targets. And this is a histogram of the names of the planets I'll be observing, or the transits I'll be observing. Uh, there's also a nice pano of uh, our observatory on the prairie out there. It's pretty nice. Next slide, please. Uh, so with the data, uh, hopefully I'm going to add to the data sets that exist for these targets, uh, particularly on the Exoplanet Transit Database, or ETD. Uh, so I already observed just one example here is Trace 3b, which isn't on my target list, but it's a big, bright planet that I was able to observe. And down here, uh, this is the data set for that planet on ETD, and this blue dot is special because that's my blue dot, and that's where my data fits in with the rest of the data there. So this demonstrated that I can actually do this, which was very reassuring for me. Uh, the data sets for the planets I will be contributing to look more like WASP 60b up there. That's the uh, OC diagram for the transit duration. It's very sparse. Uh, and hopefully for a planet like kelt one b that I'll be observing the most, I will have 18 observations for that. And hopefully we'll be able to fill out this OC diagram uh, looking also for TTV signals uh, there. So uh, my poster is down at the far end on the right. Uh, come find me. My name is Sean. Thank you. Um, so, hi everyone. My name is Romina Petrucci. I am a postdoctoral fellow at Astronomical Observatory of Cordoba in Argentina. Uh, today I'm going to briefly describe the main purpose of my postdoctoral research project. Um, here I can I show you a figure of a minimum planetary mass versus orbital period for the more than 1,600 exoplanets known today. Uh, here there, there is a very particular group of exoplanets with orbital periods smaller than 1.5 days. Uh, as you can see, some of them are Jupiter-like planets, and their final fates uh, are to spiral in toward so their host stars. Uh, this uh, systematic decreasing in the semi-major axis is known as orbital decay, and these systems are really important because they represent a challenge for the theories of formation and evolution uh, of planetary systems. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, one of the methods proposed to detect this kind of phenomena consists of uh, measuring the mid-transit times of transiting exoplanets during several years. Uh, then, if these measurements reveal that the observed mid-transit times as are produced systematically earlier than the predicted ones, then we can suppose the planet is suffering orbital decay. So, uh, the main purpose of our project is to search, uh, is to perform a photometric follow-up of stars with transiting hot Jupiter-like planets to evaluate the presence of orbital decay in these systems. To do this, we are using two Argentinian telescopes, one of 1.54 meters and the other one of 2.15 meters. Uh, here I show you one of the transit we have already obtained, and you are welcome to see our preliminary results in my poster, number 36. So, thank you very much. Hello. My name is Luke Bauma, and I just completed my first year at MIT working with the TESS team. So, TESS, or the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, is a space-based search for small planets 
orbiting bright stars. It is scheduled to launch in December of 2017, and shortly thereafter, it will observe the southern and then the northern ecliptic hemispheres. So with that said, we're not actually sure what we should do with TESS after its primary mission. The spacecraft itself could very well be operable for up to a decade. So would it be best to just repeat the observing strategy of the primary mission, or should we try something else, perhaps observing an ecliptic pole or the ecliptic itself? My main message is that any extended mission scenario will come with trade-offs. So let me give you an example based on planet detection simulations that I've been working on. Next slide, please. Thank you. It turns out that of the three scenarios that I presented on the earlier slide, the ecliptic pole scenario maximizes the number of new planets at long orbital periods that you can detect with tests. It also maximizes the number of new habitable zone planets and multiple planet systems. The ecliptic plane scenario detects fewer new planets, for reasons that I'm happy to discuss. However, these new planets tend to orbit brighter host stars, which means that, as a whole, they're more amenable to atmospheric characterization. Now, this type of trade-off that I've presented, which is one based purely on planet detection statistics, is only one of many factors that need to be considered when choosing what to do over you know, a long potential observing baseline with TESS. If this topic is interesting to you, then I invite you to please come find me by my poster. I will be at uh, number six later this afternoon. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Akshita Krishnamurthy, um, and I am a graduate student at MIT as well, um, also part of the test team. Um, today, I'll be, I will be presenting on um, an optical test bench that would um, characterize the absolute quantum efficiency of the test CCD detectors. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, here we see um, the test camera assembly. So TESS will employ four wide field optical CCD cameras um, with a band pass of 650, 10, 15 nanometers. Um, so what we see here right next to it is the CCD mosaic with four um, back illuminated MIT Lincoln Lab CCID 80 devices um, and, and an engineering device, one of like, that's, that's like this is what I will be characterizing and also measuring the quantum efficiency using this test bed. So the measurement of quantum efficiency um, is very important um, for, for this application, mainly because we want to know um, how accurately or how, how well we can measure the quantum efficiency between 650 to 1050, which is the redder region where the quantum efficiency drops very precipitously. Um, so using a laser-driven laser light source, um, a light stabilization unit, that brings down the variations to almost a few parts per million when averaged over 60 seconds. Um, an, integrating light, an integrating sphere to produce uniform elimination of the CCD and the reference diode, which is in the chamber. Um, and that's the setup that I will be describing in my poster as well. My poster is uh, number 24, um, and you can find me this afternoon. Okay. 